You might also go to the next if they need it. Okay, let's go to the Lord for it. Lord, uh, we thank you for this really nice day you've given us to be here. We appreciate the cool weather and the moisture we've had. Lord, we uh, know that's your hand at work, and we really appreciate it. As uh, Brother James stated before, uh, I ask that you be with the families and the uh, emergency services persons, personnel, military personnel, uh, their families, and be with the people that lost someone in the 9-11 incident. Man. They uh, they suffered through a lot of pain and anguish uh, unnecessarily, uh, something that should never have happened. And Lord, I ask that you be with those people and comfort them because I know it brings back bad memories on a day like this uh, to them. Be with them and, and get them through what they need to be doing and get them through this day uh, as best they can. Lord, uh, we ask that you continue to bless this church. God, Brother James, in his message today, uh, we're glad to have him back. He has been gone on vacation, and uh, we're glad to have him back safe and sound. Uh, we uh, appreciate you letting us uh, have Brother Stone last week to cover for him. Uh, very good message, and we're very appreciative of Gary coming here and doing that. Lord, uh, Please bless us through the rest of this day. Get us through the rest of this service. Be with us. And we're able to come back here again on the next seven. I ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, please stand. We are going to have communion today. You say we are or are not? Oh, we are not. <laughs> <laughs> so, say, I put it on there.
Saturday, Father, we come to you this morning and give you thanks for the many blessings that you have given us. We thank you for this day, this beautiful Sabbath day, and visit. we come together in your name to worship you. We give you thanks for answering our prayers, dear Lord, the, uh, the prayers to bring our parents back up, and you have answered their prayers, and we give you all the credit and the glory for that. Amen. We pray that you will Amen. continue to pour out your blessings on this church. We ask that you'll be Brother James with his brother James this morning and she give us a message. Just give us uh let him give the words that he would tell us to hear. As we come to give back the portion of what you've given us, we would pray that you will bless this offer, bless the gift from the giver. <coughs> Forgive us of our many sins now and go with us for the manner of this service and the remainder of this set of faith. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
very last question. trying to get the sound set there, I will mention one more time that the uh, uh, steel, West Texas Steel Guitar Association jam is still on. Uh, it's a little bit of a question, maybe you wouldn't give it the last message I got. It is on for the 25th, and if there's anybody here that hadn't heard that, it, uh, West Texas Steel Guitar is going to have their semi-annual little jam session out here in Fellowship all of September. 25th at uh, 2 o'clock, 5 p.m. It's free to be a live band out there. It's a great steel place you're going to see. Yes. Yes.
paid for. But you know what? I paid for it so that I could give it to y'all. But it's not just going to give it to you. You have to ask for it. So would you be like one? Say. And I have my sweet. May I have one? Yes. You should sure can. Do you want one to get? Yes. Okay, here you go. Do I know what you? Yeah, you can have one. I know you're asking. All right. So, has anybody ever heard the word salvation? <coughs> yeah? Salvation means saving humans from sin and consequences of those sins, which is separation from God. Pretty bad. Who paid for our salvation? God. We, God, Jesus. Yes. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid for our sins. So that we could have the free gift of salvation to go to heaven. Alright, got a little verse here. Hold on, let me find it. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a free gift of God, not by work, so that no man can boast. Did y'all have to do anything to earn those suckers? Did you have to work? Did you have to run around the block? Did you have to do any push-ups? No, they were free. I worked for them. I paid for them. And they're free for you. That's how God's salvation is for us. We don't have to do anything to earn it. We just have to ask for it. We have to receive it. Yeah. In Romans, so how do we receive it? You ask. In Romans, 10, 9, and 10, it says, If you openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you have to ask and say, I know you did it. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every one of y'all that, that asks for this candy received it. That's how we receive our <coughs> salvation from God. We ask for it and receive it. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for this wonderful day. Thank you for these kiddos being here today. Thank you for them asking for their supper. And I pray that when they're ready, that they'll ask for us their salvation. Thank you for that free gift of salvation that we don't have to work for. We don't have to do anything to earn it. But you did it for us. And Jesus paid the price for us. Amen. Yeah. I'm back. I don't know. Well. I didn't receive any money, so I had to come back. <laughs> I told y'all when I left that usually when I go to Red Ocean, y'all get a lot of rain here. And this was no exception. And they said, well, where's your good rain? Well, you can stay another week. I said, that's right. They didn't get money. Nobody didn't get no money. So here I am. <laughs> you got to have money to stay up there. And you mean, uh, but anyhow, we're glad. Huh? But you got to be here with us. Good morning. Good to be here this morning. <laughs> oh, boy. So we did. Have, we had a good time. And I said, I told somebody who was coming at night to raise the windows. And let that cool air come in. Well, the morning you're coming from cover. And this morning when we walked out of the house, it felt like we had opened this morning. It really did. It's nice out there today. But uh, we're glad to be back. And again, I want to uh, offer my thank you uh, to Brother Stone for coming and filling in for us while we were gone. And uh, we appreciate all of you that took time out to come and be a part of the service with him. And I watched the service today. It looks a lot better today. Amen. 
I mean, this side over here was nearly empty. I was afraid it was, I could just see some empty pews just at all up and down there. I go, where in the world did everybody go? And, but anyhow, we're glad to get back. We finally broke that 80 again, and we're headed back to that 100 mark. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we thank God for that today. Thank you for that beautiful special this morning, and it is great. And guys and gals and band, I felt like I was in a Baptist church this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Good old songs right down on the hymn. That's that great. Uh, it's hard to beat them old tiny hymns. It really is. All right, getting about this morning, I'm going to turn to the book of Exodus. We're doing communion this morning. And by the way, the word communion is no word in the Bible. It is a man made word. It is a legitimate word. I looked it up again this morning just to double check and make sure that my mind, you know, I, I, what I remember. And it says a gathering together of people. Basically. That's the redneck version. Webster has a better explanation for it. But, so why do we celebrate communion? Where do we get communion? How do we do communion? Is there a preparation for communion? Where did it start? Well, you know communion started all the way back in the book of Exodus. It's not something new. It's not a church-made thing. It started all the way back in the book of Exodus. And this morning, if you will allow me, I'm going to try to answer the questions on where it started, how, how we are to do it, why are we to do it, and who is allowed to do it. And then the final question, when should we do it? All of these things are things because a lot of people don't understand communion. They know we have a communion deal and it's passed out and you get this little bitty bit of, of wine. Of course, you know, you're out of love. It's it, well, it's great for you this morning, but uh, yeah, we, we, get this, we get this little well, it's great for you. Right, right, right. Right. Not grapefruit. Have you seen that on the It may not be. <laughs> but we celebrate that, and people will take communion and then they'll leave and not even stop and think about what they just did. Well, why did they just get? Did we do it because we're just here? And that's what the service was today. So we did all along the service. And we do this for that reason. So this morning, if you allow me, I'm going to go back to Exodus chapter number 12. And we're going to learn where the very beginning of communion started. The churches cannot take credit for communion. I don't care what church it is. They cannot take credit for communion. It started way before the church started. It was a God thing, not a religious thing. So in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1, we find the story of uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. We find the story, the children of Israel, of course, are in bondage. They're, in, they're in, under slavery. They're in the land of Egypt. The, they have a tyrant that's over them, Pharaoh, that's making them work and making them their life miserable. And Moses is there to free them and bring them to the promised land. And you know all know the story. Uh, you probably watched it on television because they made movies of it. So you know what happened during that time. But there's something specifically that happened during the time before Pharaoh finally allowed the children of Israel to leave. <coughs> and this is where we're going to start to pick up the story today. Verse chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, 
saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of month, and it shall be the first month of, to, to, of the year to you. Now, anybody have any idea what that month is? April. Jewish calendar, our calendar, this would be our April. And so, they are talking about, he said, in the, in the land, the month shall be unto you to the beginning a month. So everything's going to start there in April and move forward. When do we celebrate Easter? March or April. April. Most of the time. Once in a while we'll find fall in different areas, but April is what we celebrate Easter Sunday. What happens the week before Easter Sunday? It's Passover week. So that's what we're going to look at this morning because it says in verse number 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, this month of April, thou shalt take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their father, and a lamb for a house. And if the household is too little for the lamb, let him, his neighbor, next unto him, how take it according to the number of souls, and every man, according to his eating, shall make you count of the lamb. So, he gives him to take the lamb, and this lamb, of course, we're going to find out it's going to be slaughtered, and the, the, the blood is going to be used. But he said, what is the poor family? What if your neighbor could not afford a spotless lamb? But what do we do? We are to treat our neighbor. We are to be there for our neighbor. We are to help our neighbor do the things that God wants us to do. So it's a family thing. When we get together, we're doing it as a family. That's why we do it in church. And we do it as a church family because if I do it, it makes a difference when all of us together can do it. Yeah. It becomes a family thing. So not just an individual thing. The lamb, verse 5, shall be without blemish, male of the first year. You shall take it out of the sheep or the goat, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And notice the timing here. He keeps talking about days. All these days have a particular meaning. And we're going to find out what those are a little later on as we get into the message today. But each time he says, you're to keep it a certain amount of time, and he gave the day how long they were so there's a preparation of the community. Our guys this morning and ladies came in and they prepared <coughs> our communion tray with the, the bread and with the, the grape juice and they got it ready. So it took a preparation. Uh, a lot of running around and, and people going different directions and going and we've got enough grape juice, y'all you can have 16 ounce can bottles if you want to today. We've got enough left over. But, uh, <laughs> so I bought some, Lily brought some, uh, we got a bunch. But it took some preparation. We had to get ready for it. Debbie made preparation for today. He said, You're both. That's how we were going to do it to all these things are prepared. So he's talking about preparing this lamb. Because the lamb, there's something specific about him that we're going to find out. He said, keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. In the evening. Again, that deals with time. And they shall take of the blood and sprinkle it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house 
work it in thy healthy head. So there's a taking in the house in the evening, but they're slay the line, the lamb, and take the blood and put it over the door post and over the side of the post. Because there's a specific reason for that. And we'll get into that in a minute, why this was so uh, necessary in that time. But they would do it, and then no one can go in or out of that door until the morning time. So they're there from the evening till the morning, and the blood is over the door. Now, what about the leftover? Here we go. And they and they shall eat the flesh in the night, roasted with fire, unleavened bread, and with the bitter herb they shall eat it. So there you have the eating of the unleavened bread, and you have the blood. What do we celebrate? The breaking of the bread and the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary. This is all the beginning of what we consider as communion. Now, eat not, get raw. In other words, don't just go out there and start gnawing on it before it's cooked. I'm not a big lamb to uh, eater, but I'm also not very much of a raw meat eater. I like it, you know, if it ain't deep fried and, and grease about that deep, it's not good. Yeah. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a grease person. Verse 9 says, Eat it not raw, nor saw with no water, but roast with fire, his head and his leg, with the pertaining thereof. Now, there's a reason for that. In other words, they roasted it whole. They did not cut it up. It was not divided. You, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen some of the movies where they uh, like roast a, a, a pig or a cow in the old western day. They would build a fire and they just hang it on there and they just keep rotating it until it got good and done and they'd pull the barrel of knife and cut them off the home. This is kind of the same thing. Because there's a reason for that. Not a limb of our Lord and Savior was broken the day he died on the cross. This all set the example for what Jesus did on Calvary that day. And it shall let nothing of it remain. No leftover. Don't pack lunch for tomorrow. There was no to go cup for you to take home to eat for supper the next night. That was not what it was designed for. It was not a food for you to enjoy for several days. So what was to do with the leftover? It wasn't thrown in the trash. And you show nothing for the remain until the morning and that which remain until the morning shall be burned up with fire. So anything that was left over of that land, they were to build the fire up higher and higher, and they were to burn it to a creek. So that there was nothing to remain. And thus shall you eat it, and when the Lord would Shall you eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it with hate. It is the Lord's Passover. Very first time we find the word Passover. It is not our Passover. It was not meant for them. It was meant to give honor and glory. God. Because anybody could eat uh, you know, a lamb steak anytime they wanted to if they had an animal. But this was a specific custom, a specific reason for this doing. And he said, You are to take this. And anything left over, he said, You're to make sure. Then he said, There's a 
proper way of doing it. Why the right clothes? I assure you, your lawns is dirty, your shoes are on your feet. I don't think we've got anybody in here barefoot at this point, but if you got your shoes on when we do, or got your shoes off when we do communion, we ask you to put your shoes back on at this point. No. Yeah, I, I understand we're from Texas, but that's okay. Even with your lawns dirty, in verse 12 it says, And I will pass to the land of Egypt this night. And will smite all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. And I will execute judgment, for I am God. And the blood shall be to you a token unto your house. Where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be unto you to destroy you when I smite the land of peace. So we find the beginning of Passover and the beginning of what we call communion started way back in the book of Exodus. Now, let's move forward. Let's go forward to all the way to the book of Matthew. And let's notice what he said concerning, we're still talking about Passover, we're still talking about time and preparation of what we're doing. In Matthew chapter number 26, Matthew chapter 26, we will find the remaining story of the Passover. Matthew chapter 26, look at verse number 17. Now the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat Passover? So the disciples are coming to Jesus, and now how and where are we to prepare the Passover? And he said, Go into the city of such a man, and say unto him, The master said, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at the house with my disciples. So he's saying, The time is at hand. What time? The time that he would go to the cross and there shed his blood and to die for you and I. It's at that time. So he went and they found a particular place. We use the church. It's not something that we do, uh, you know, I woke up this morning, decided I was just going to do communion, and I took me a little uh, grape juice, and I took me a, uh, some bread, and I said, I did, I did communion this morning. That's not communion. Communion is done in a specific place that comes with specific people in a specific time and for a specific reason. Communion is very important. He said, go into the, now verse 19 says, and the disciples did that Jesus had appointed them. And they made ready to pass up. And when they even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they exceedingly sorrowed, and they began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dipped his hand with me in the ditch, the same shall betray me. And the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man in whom the Son of Man is betrayed. For it is better good for that man that he has never been born. Can you imagine what was going through Jesus' character and mind about that moment? For he knew he was the one that was going to betray. But for Jesus to tell him it was better 
for you never to have been born and for you to betray me. I like you and I accepting our Lord and Savior as our Savior. Today we ask Jesus to come into our heart like they were like Harry was talking to the young kid this morning. And today we ask Jesus to come into our heart. You know, it's better for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or it's better that you would have never even been born. <clears throat> Think about that for me. Because if you accept Jesus Christ, you live forever. Yeah, that's right. If you don't accept him, You'll die for eternity in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'd rather not even been born to know that I was going to have to eternity in heaven. Early age, I didn't know that. God, I didn't think about it. And so somebody took the time to tell me there was a difference. And what's that difference was? And Judas said, betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it. And he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, for this is my body. And as he took the cup, and he gave thanks unto them, he said, Drink ye all of it. After he went over, give you 16 ounce cup, but we want you to drink it all. I know some of you talk to drink, but I could not drink 16 ounces of grape juice. I do not like grape juice. Uh, I wish we had grape juice, but we didn't. <laughs> For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. So the blood that you are taking when you take communion represents the remission of sin in your life over what Jesus did that day on the I think I make a big thing out of communion because I feel like it is important. I try to build my whole service around communion. Because I don't want it to become a custom or a ritual or something we do because happy you know, Bulletin said we're supposed to have communion this morning, but whew, we're going to do it. And that's my question. It ought to be a special time for you and your family and for your friends and most of all for you and I as neighbors. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drank it new with you in the Father's kingdom. When are we going to have communion? Is there a specific time, a specific day that we're doing? I was raised in the first church that I pastored in. The church that I came out of, we did communion once a year. We did it the Sunday before Easter to represent Passover and to give glory to God for that time. A lot of religions do it by monthly. Some do it uh, weekly. There is no specific time for you to do it. There's no wrong or right way. We're going to find out. And the scripture says, it says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So, Jesus said to his example, he said, now I'm not going to do it again until I can do it with you in the kingdom of my father. So, we're not going to wait until we get to heaven to have communion. So, when are we going to have it? Well, there is no specific time that you can do it. I feel like we do it too often. It loses its meaning. It loses its value. And it loses what Jesus has in store for us to do. 
maybe once a year, not often enough. When we first started this church, or first got to this church, we did once a year. Uh, a lot of folks complained and said, oh, but we got to go to the meeting more often. I didn't know why, but I was, I was subject to it, so we did. Now we may be able to support it. Doesn't make a difference to me, as long as you do it and I do it for the honor and glory of God, not to just say, bless God, we had to be in this one. They all have a take me to you. I can spend an hour. Let me, let me move on. When they had sung the hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Move to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I told you all these things have a specific meaning. And so you learn or have been taught why they are so important throughout the Word of God. We all need to know. Where the meaning came from, why we do it, and what the purpose of it is. One verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 7. 5 and verse 7. Heard you out thereof of the old letter that you may be a new lamb, as you were unleavened. For the evening, Christ, our Passover, is signified of us. So, whose Passover? Christ is our Passover. God doesn't require us to go out and, and slaughter a lamb anymore. We don't have to raise a spotless, without flaw lamb so that we can offer a sacrifice. When they started the sacrifice, you go all the way back to the book of Genesis. The first sacrifice took place in the Garden of Eden. When God sacrificed an animal to take the skin and use it as a covering for Adam and Eve. Now, that sacrifice had nothing to do with sin as far as forgiveness. It was the sin of them knowing the knowledge that they were without clothes, they were naked. And when they realized that, they were ashamed. So he gave them a covering to keep them from being ashamed. But that covering was not a salvation covering. All the way through the Old Testament, you find where there was a sacrifice at Passover. Was, you brought a lamb to the priest. There was a veil. You would, they would take the lamb and carry it behind the veil. They would slaughter the lamb. The blood, they would sprinkle on the mercy seat. But all it did was got your sin postponed. Rolled away. There was no salvation in it. It was only to get you fair from one year to the next. But then when Jesus died on the cross, the blood he shed that day, the one that came down from that cross, that blood was shed on you and I, and it gave us the forgiveness for sin forever for everyone that wants to receive. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a warning about communion. I got to quickly, I, I know it would take a lot of time, but I pray that you'll bear with me for just a moment. Let me finish this, and then we'll get into our communion. Brenda didn't bring her a lot, so she ain't got no time, did she? So, <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 11 talks about who we take communion. Who is worth it? Well, none of us are worthy, amen? There's none of us really worthy to take communion. So how do we know? Well, look at verse number 23 of chapter 11 of the book of 1 Corinthians. 
And I receive of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. And the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Taste, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do it remember to me. And after the same manner, he took the cup, which is for the same, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, and ye do ye as often as ye drank it in remembrance of me. There again is talking about the time. All this has something to do with time. How often do we do it? As often as you do it. You do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So you see there is, there is a condition. Are you worthy? Well, none of you are worthy. So what happened? God gives us a way out. But let a man examine himself. This is not something that I do. I can't tell you when you can take the union. That's up to you. In our church, we believe in open communion. Now there is a difference. There is closed communion and open communion. And the church that practices closed communion, you visitors are with this morning will be not allowed to take communion with us today. If you never join this church, you cannot take communion with us today. If you never accepted Christ, you could not take communion with us today. But in open communion, anybody that's born again into the family of God, that's washed by the blood of Jesus, you are have the ability, you have the the what am I the word I want to use for? You have the right to take communion. Not by who you are. Not a member of a church. You can be a member of any church. Maybe you raised in a uh, Methodist background, Baptist background, Catholic background. It doesn't matter what walk of life you've been on. What matters is, are you saved? And no one knows that except you. So after he asked, he said, take a moment to examine yourself and see. Well, I am worthy to partake of communion. Now, is it wrong if you refuse communion? No, it is not. That is your choice. You can observe it with us today, or you can reject it. That's pretty left to you. And no one will judge you. When these guys come by in a moment and they pass out the communion to you, if you want to take one out, fine. If you want to say no, they're not going to say, hey, preacher, this guy over here just won't take him. They're not going to point you out. They're not going to pick on you. Because maybe there's something in your life that you don't feel like you're exactly right. And before you do that, you would like to get things right. That's the reason that I personally have always give an invitation before we do the communion. And I know we're running a little behind this one, and I would have followed it up for him. Uh, I always give us time because I want you to reflect on your life, I want you to examine yourself. And my word. With a clear conscience, a clear mind, and a smile on my face, and I take that communion cup, and I can hold it in my hand, and I can put it in my leg, and I can drink it, and not have to worry. The Lord will bless me, and I'll feel better. Yeah. But you can't do it. We're going to give you an opportunity. 
I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come. We're going to give a short invitation this morning. And then we'll return for our communion today. I, tell you, I know the service has been a little long. I apologize for that, but we've got to make sure. And we do communion. We do it in the right place. At the right reason. At the right time. And with the right attitude. So that is for I think our communion service ought to be the most important thing that we did. Preaching is good, all service is good. But when you're getting to a place like this, when you're getting ready for communion, you don't have to stand today. I want you to step out right where you are. For just a moment, I want you to just bow your head. And I want you to reflect. Do what the Bible says. Examine your heart today. And say, Am I worthy? And if you're not, we get ready this morning on the very first verse of this very first song today. I ask you to step out. Maybe you didn't come to this altar. Or maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, Preacher, I can't take the name. I've never been saved. You can fix that this morning. God will open his arms up to you and receive. Father, thank you for this service today. And God, we ask you to bless this time of examining our hearts today. Lord, may we do what we do today with a clear heart and a clear conscience. And we smile and we go and we give us praise.
Anybody did not get one. I served my brother in the same token he served me. Take the two apart. And it said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, He, this is my body, which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you so much for your body that was not broken that day on Calvary, that you died that we might have life. Amen. And after the same man, he took the cup. And when he had sipped, saying, This cup is in your testament. It is my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
Father, we lift up this cup to you this morning. Thank you so much for the blood you shed that day on Calvary. And Lord, as we do this, we're giving you thanks and we're remembering that blood on Calvary. In Jesus' name. Let's dance.